morning, everybody. I'd just like to welcome everybody to the Conference of Western Wayne, December 10th, 2021 meeting. At this time, I would like to have uh, call the meeting to order and uh, have Mayor Wild uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance and welcome everybody. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Westland City Hall. I'm going to lead, lead you in a pledge and then our cable department put together a three minute video that we're going to we're going to share with everybody. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. funds are going to be used to provide or service the fire safety components of 54 small businesses right here in our This is a major investment in this community's health. Today, as we open the brand new uh, Westland Community Health Center, this is a $10 million state-of-the-art facility that is going to be staffed by some of the most dedicated medical experts who will offer Westland residents access to high-quality care close to home. Starting with the cities, Belleville? Here. Dearborn? Dearborn Heights? Here. Garden City? Here. Inkster? Livonia? Present. Northville? Here. Plymouth? Here. Romulus? Wayne? Here. Westland? Here. The townships of Canton? Here. Here in Township is here, Northville? Here. Plymouth? Here. Redford? Here. Sumter? Van Buren Township. Here. Okay. 
this time we're going to have introductions. Uh, start to my left, Mayor Wild. If you want to kick it off, we'll come down this way and come around. Good morning, Bill Wild, Mayor of the City of Westland. Good morning, I'm Marie Graham, Judy, and Township Supervisor. Hi, Maureen Miller Brasman, City of Livonia. Mark Addo, Morning, happy holidays. Brian Turnbull, Mayor of Northville. Morning, John Racy, Mayor of the City of Wayne. Laura Haynes, Conference of Western Wayne. Nick Laura, Mayor of the City of Plymouth. Kevin McNamara, Supervisor of Van Buren Township. Diane Webb, Superintendent of Bradford Township. Uh, Merry Christmas, David Glave, Supervisor here on Township. Merry Christmas, Bob McCray, Mayor of Wayne, or Rhonda, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Township Supervisor. Jalen Lynch, City of Garden City. Dave Robinson, City Manager and uh, Police Chief in the City of Belvoir. Okay, go ahead and start the audience. There you go. Craig Brown, Chief Innovation Officer, City of Westland. Uh, Jason Ryans, Treasurer, Northville Township. Colin Colbert, Michigan Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Haley Stevens. Debbie Dingle, Congresswoman Lewis Paul. Good morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Mary Jo, City of Romulus, Economic Development Department, and Treasurer for the Year of Okay, we'll go back. the Councilman elect for our City of Dubois. Amy Brown, Field Rep for Congresswoman Debbie Dingle. Dennis Davidson, representing Eric Sabree and the Wayne County Treasurer's Office. Good morning, Tony Guerrero here on behalf of Kim Worthy, your Wayne County Prosecutor. Good morning, everyone. Chris Girdwood, Detroit Region Aerotropolis. Uh, good morning, J.B. Johnson, the Wayne County Executive Office. Good morning, Larissa Richardson, Congress Hall Member Sheets, mm -hmm. Good morning, Joseph Hover, Deputy Supervisor, Kim Township. Uh, good morning, Kathy Harmon, Fire Chief in Garden City. I'm representing the uh, <coughs> Wayne County Fire Department Mutual Aid Association. Good morning, Dave Schreiber, Wayne County Economic Development. Good morning, Ed Harris, Wayne County Commissioner of the Good morning, I'm Olson, Senior Alliance. Uh, Dan Block, Budget Director, City of Westland. Good morning, Stephen Smith, Finance Director, City of Westland. Good morning, Stephanie Field, Human Resource Director for the City of Westland. Morning, Merry Christmas. Uh, I'm County Commissioner Ray Basham, 14th District. Good morning, Gabrielle Dingle, Constituent Services for <coughs> Commissioner Ray Basham. Good morning, Merry Christmas. My name is Kamala Hall, I'm Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Kamal Sawapi, Business Development Manager for Wayne County. Uh, Richard Cummer, Deputy Chief of Police, City of Westland. Good morning, Merry Christmas. Daryl Stanford, Deputy Chief, Westland Player. Good morning, Jeff Jedrusik. I'm the West Side Police Chief, but I'm representing the Wayne County Association of Chiefs of Police. Good morning, Rick Barra, Facility Director, City of West Wayne. Good morning, Hassan Saab, City of West Wayne. Doug Morton, City of West Wayne, DPS. Good morning, Ramsey Algarib, DPS Director, City of West Wayne. Good morning, Aubrey Berman, Economic Development Director, City of West Wayne. Jennifer Stamper, I'm the Assessor for the Townships of Sumter and Van Buren, as well as the cities of Valvella, Plymouth, Wayne, and West Wayne. And I'm Ralph Walton, Building Director for the City of Westland. Good morning and happy holidays. Joanne Campbell, Housing and Community Development Director for the City of Westland. Good morning, Paul Mods, Youth Assistance Director for the City of Westland. Good morning, Kyle Mulligan, Parks Recreation Director, City of Westland. Good morning, Devin Adams, Controller for the City of Westland. Good morning, Joe Burton, Municipal Service Bureau Director, City of Westland. Okay, we have one more person who just came. Oh, hi. I'm Congresswoman Lashiva Spidey for the 13th Congressional District. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we're going to, uh, we're looking for the adoption of the agenda. Can I have a motion? So moved. Supported. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we, do, we don't have a treasurer's report th uh, today, but uh, Mayor Turnbull is going to explain why. For the first time in two years, we don't have a treasurer's report. Our treasurer or our accountant for CWW got COVID, so we don't have any information from last time. We went in great detail last time, so I'm giving you a few minutes back of your life today. So happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> okay, the approval of the meeting minutes. 
Supervisor Glabe? Uh, the meeting minutes of November 12th, 2021 are in your packet. I would move for approval. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, director's report. Ms. Haynes. All right, I'm gonna do my best today to pretend like I'm Jordan. So kind of hang on here with me. Um, some good news, our 911 legislation has passed both the House and the Senate with overwhelming support. We are working with the governor's office to have a signing ceremony. If we're able to, uh, we will invite our board to be there as well. There are three forms at your seat. There's a conflict of interest form, an alternate form, and a form for contact information. Um, we do need each of these back by the January meeting or at the January meeting. Feel free to fill them out while you're here and just leave them at your seat. Bring them back to me at January or email them at your convenience. Uh, 2022 YAP funding, both the 2020 and 2021 were atypical years for YAP. This resulted in leftover CCF funds in both years. The 110th Mill Committee's recommendation for the 2022 YAP funding is to keep it the same as 2021. Funding levels can be altered mid-year, but this will give our YAPs a chance to utilize the same funding amounts previously allocated to the item. So I do need um, a motion and support for this so we can um, let our YAPs know their funding for next year. So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. At the January 14th, 2022 CWW board meeting, the board will be approving the 2022 CWW committee assignments. Your service to the committees is sincerely appreciated. Please take this opportunity to review various committees and assignments. If you would like to be added or removed from any of our committees, please let Ms. Selick know prior to the end of the year. Um, we do need three new members for the Wayne Counts at Transit Authority and at least one alternate member. The millage renewal needs to be authorized by the committee by March. This millage funds uh, the SMART system. There are three to four meetings annually, but this committee, this is a committee we are required by law to nominate members for. The Wayne County Commission will then do a final approval of nominated members. So again, for that committee, we do need three new three new full members and one new alternate. If you have interest in this committee, please let Jordan know. Um, the 110th Mill Committee meets two to three times a year and its primary function is to review funds received from Wayne County. 110th Mill of the Wayne County Jail Millage is dedicated to providing funds for community youth assistance programs. On behalf of its member communities, CWW enters into contractual agreements with Wayne County. Uh, the Currently, the CWW receives annual funds of about $136,000 for one-tenth mill and about $472,000 for CCF. The one-tenth mill committee removes, reviews and approves annual funding rec recommendations from GrowthWorks, who is the fa CWW facilitator of youth assistance programs. The committees will then make recommendations like we did today um, to the full board on how these funds should be dispersed. So our current subcontractors are GrowthWorks, the City of Wayne, City of Westland, Garden City, and the City of Northville. If you're interested in being included on this committee, please let us know. Uh, we also have the Southeast Michigan Government Alliance Committee, which is the government, governing board of SEMCA. It is comprised of elected officials from the SEMCA region. Currently, Wayne County Commissioner Al Hades is our, um, is our appointee on there, and Jordan Selleck is our alternate. We also have a Goals and Objectives Committee and Joint Transportation Committee with DCC. So for the 2022 Executive Committee, the nominating committee's informational report is below. The board will vote on this recommendation at the January 14th, 2022 meeting. The 2022 Executive Committee will be sworn in after the vote by Judge Catherine Heisey. The nominating committee, comprised of Supervisor Mark Abbo, Mayor Corrine Connolly and Ma uh, Mayor John Racy will be recommending the following slate for officers. And we will have, uh, we're offering the chair as Mayor John Racy, Vice Chair as Supervisor David Glabe, Secretary Mayor Brian Turnbull, Treasurer Mayor Maureen Bronson, and uh, Chair Emeritus Mayor Corrine Connolly. So we will vote on that at our January meeting. Our January meeting will be January 14th and held at Plymouth Township Hall. And are there any questions on the executive director's report? No? Okay. 
Well, I guess we'll just go right into a legislative right update. Right into it, okay. Um, so the House and Senate have started allocating um, some ARPA funding. First one I wanna talk about is House Bill 5522, sponsored by Rep. Mike Mueller, and this was passed by the House. In this bill, there is funding for $57.5 million to recruit and offer incentives to out-of-state officers, $7.5 million for mental health services, $40 million for scholarships to the police academy, $10 million for riot gear and body armor, $10 million to reimburse local law enforcement officers for leave time for COVID-19 quarantines, $50 million for school resource officers, and $28 million to provide the same offers to fire and EMS personnel. They've also started um, proposing water infrastructure funding. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 565, which provides $3.3 billion for water infrastructure, $350 million for drinking water projects, such as connecting adjacent systems, consolidating systems, and building or replacing drinking water facilities, $1 billion for lead service line replacements, What's most important to note about this is if your community has already done lead service line replacements, you will not be able to collect any of this money um, in this package. 200 million for sanitary and combined se uh, sewer overflow projects, 100 million for stormwater, asset management, and wastewater program grants. Both of these previously mentioned bills will need to pass their opposite chamber and be signed by the governor. These are still being negotiated. Um, I expect these funds, the amounts will change. We'll just have to kind of see what happens. Um, we've all heard a lot about this economic incentive package that uh, was passed this week. The legislature has fast-tracked several bills referred to as the Strategic Outreach and Attraction Reserve Fund. The House bills are 5602, 5603, and 5604, and they would be used to create incentives that will help Michigan communities remain competitive by offering money which could be used to get future job sites shovel ready for projects. There's no specific revenue source in these bills yet, and they would be subject to an annual appropriation. I will include the analysis of these bills in the email that I send out after the meeting. Um, it's, I think, 11 pages. Um, what's interesting about this package is that we don't know how much money they're looking to put in. All of the legislators that have been involved in crafting these bills have been required to sign NDAs by the Michigan Ed uh, Economic Development Corporation. So they're not allowed to talk about the projects. They're, they're not really talking about how much money is here. So we're gonna have to kind of wait and see. Um, the Senate has passed their version, the House has passed their version, and now they need to come together um, and decide exactly what these bills are gonna look at. I expect that will happen on Tuesday. And then we'll have a lot more information. Lastly, I just wanna remind everybody about 3G decommissioning. Older phones running on the 3G network will stop working in early 2022. AT&T will discontinue service in February. T-Mobile um, slash Sprint sometime between March and July. And Verizon at the end of 2022. Most people who have a phone plan with one of these providers will be notified, but if the phone is purely used for 911 service and not connected to a carrier, there will be no notification. So we're asking um, that our communities try to get this information out. A lot of these phones have gone to domestic violence shelters to be given out. Um, a lot of low income families have these phones. Um, and it's really, really important that we let them know that these phones are not gonna work anymore starting in February. So that is all I have. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Any questions? Seeing none, I guess we'll just go ahead and move on. Um, at this time, we have a presentation from Khalil from the Wayne County Economic Development. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, and to the rest of the body. And my apologies, I don't have a, the presentation. There's issues with whatever. But I do know that at one o'clock today, we're also hosting another meeting that I think all of you are invited to, our typical Friday meetings that I know some of you attend religiously and I can't thank you enough for, where we're gonna give a more extensive presentation, something that we gave to our county commissioners regarding the $339 million of ARPA funds that the county received. So um, I really wanna thank you all for the opportunity to just come share with you all where we are in the process of spending these funds and what you can anticipate in the hopefully months to come. Uh, as you all know, again, we received about $339 million. 
And some months ago, we decided that you know one of the best ways to spend these funds in the most transformational way to help move Wayne County and recover from the pandemic was to team up with local municipalities and how we spend our funds together and hopefully combine our resources and our buying power, if you will, to go to the state of Michigan who received $6.5 billion. Again, in a state where you have less than 10 million people, Wayne County has about 1.8 million people. Um, and so we think there's a significant case to be made that a lot of that money should come back into Wayne County, which is one of the hardest hit counties you know, from the coronavirus. And so some months ago, we did a territorial and we uh, opened up a portal and we taught you know, a lot of members on your staffs how to submit projects to us. Luckily, we have received at least one project from every single municipality. Most municipalities submitted three or four or five projects. Um, we're in the process of vetting over 250, maybe 300 projects that really total somewhere between 2.5 and $3 billion of requests. Obviously, we, we have $339 million. Uh, and so vetting through those things is, is you know, certainly not the easiest thing in the world to do. But what I will tell you is, here, here's where we are in the process. We're, we're looking and we're making progress on a few things. The first is, you know, with respect to the projects that were submitted, there's a lot of work that needs to get done to make those projects what we would call shovel ready. Uh, some of the projects need bidding documents. We need a lead agency. Uh, there needs to be a bid process that will comply with the federal auditing rules. Um, there's, a, there's certainly going to be a lot of capital investment, so there's a lot of permitting things that we have to line up. And, you know, quite frankly, some of the projects still need to be negotiated. As you can imagine, uh, if we receive a project that is, you know, 100% request of county funds for a city general fund obligation project, that is a harder project to fund than, say, a 50-50 split on a park. As just a way of a, a, a general example. And so, our business development managers are assigned to every one of your municipalities, and they're working with their counterparts in your cities and your municipalities on all kinds of projects, you know, whether it's, you know, Westland, uh, you know, the, the West, Western Wayne County YMCA, or whether it is, um, you know, Five Mile in Redford, or uh, the downtown DDA in Huron Township, MyTech, you know, uh, Ecorse Creek, and, and trust me, I, you know, Northville Downs and, and, and Daylighting of the River, and, and the senior center in Livonia, and trust me, we could, I, I could go on and on and on about every one of the projects, right? But I don't want anybody to think that progress hasn't been made. It is that we are steadily trying to get those projects to a place where we hope they become shovel ready. So that's, that's the, the first thing that we're doing. Uh, and you should know we're staffing up to do that. Um, we are hiring some people to give more concentration towards your community. So if you have a business development manager assigned to your area now, that may change, not for a bad reason, but because you're gonna get more concentration towards moving these things forward, okay? The second thing we're doing, obviously, there's still some more guidance to come out on the legislation, and we hope to receive that guidance before the end of the year, at least that's what our consultants tell us from the federal government. Um, and, and particularly, what we've heard is that the guidance will heavily regulate some of the revenue loss questions that we've been asking, and some facilities questions that we've been asking. A lot of municipalities have submitted for facilities improvements. And a lot of the questions around the facilities really have to deal with the programming within that facility. And nationwide, this is a big question that the Department of Treasury is receiving. So we hope to receive some guidance from them so that it can help us direct us on what projects may or may not be more eligible when it comes to the ones that were submitted. There's another bill that was passed by the Senate, uh, allowing about 10 million of the dollars that we received to be more flexible to be used on roads. There was a significant amount of road projects that were submitted to us. and so that level of flexibility could change the way we sort of calculate what gets approved and what doesn't get approved. Um, and obviously, that we all know that the, you know, Congresswoman Dingell and Stevens and Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib all worked you know, very hard to get some, some bills passed and other bills that are coming down uh, to get them passed. And there are bills that are 4,000 pages long. There's some questions within those bills about what are the, some of the meetings that are within the legislation. We're working very, very hard on what those details are. And the reason why is because we received a significant amount of infrastructure projects. And if there's an infrastructure bill, we try the best that we can to spend restricted dollars before unrestricted dollars, just to maximize all the opportunities that we have in front of us. That doesn't mean that we're waiting. All the projects that you have submitted to us are being worked on to get shovel ready. And in the meantime, we're trying to figure out the most strategic way to spend all the dollars that are sort of out there. Finally, I think the last thing that we're waiting for is, you know, 
you know, what you heard Laura talk about. You know, all the things that are happening at the state. If the state received, you know, $6.5 billion and there's a lot of negotiating going on and, you know, um, we have a weekly meeting with the governor's office and her chief of staff to talk about how things are monitoring, you know, uh, and certainly there are, uh, the governor has plans that she submitted. Those haven't gone very far. I know the Republicans have plans. We'll see how far those things go. Um, but we hope to have more clarity on where the 6.5 billion of ARP funds are at the state. Because again, there's a significant case to be made that money should be spent in Wayne County. And if we are combining our resources, you know, I, there's really not a good case for them not to provide us, you know, the other half of that money or whatever that, that percentage looks like. So we're working on all those things steadily. Of the 300 some projects that we've received, they really span over six different categories. And they really attack a lot of the things that we learned throughout the pandemic. What I will tell you is we've, we've sort of had this presentation and we've got a couple of our county commissioners here in the audience where we told our county commissioners, we don't plan to spend any of our money on our own internal budgets if we can help it. That's not our, that's not our plan. Our plan is to work with local municipalities and hopefully spend money in our communities to come back from all the impacts that we've had because of the virus. And those six categories attack six general problems that we have seen. We've seen a lot of health disparities, particularly among minority communities, and Wayne County is the most diverse county in the, in the state. We, uh, we learned through the pandemic that small businesses don't have the resources they need to survive, and that our local economy may not be as resilient as we'd like it to be. We know infrastructure is a big problem. We've learned a lot of that through the flooding that's taken place. We know that uh, you know, our park system in Wayne County the usage of it increased 30% during the pandemic. And we're a very old industrial county. And we need more parks. Uh, we know that workforce development is a big deal right now, especially in light of the sort of great resignation era that we're sort of living in. And we know housing's a big issue. We know that uh, you know, there was foreclosure and eviction moratoriums that were overturned by the Supreme Court. And we know through the treasurer's office, we may have a big problem in the future. So we have to try with the $339 million to help, you know, make progress on all of those issues. And so the six categories that we're spending money on, we're allocating somewhere between 60 and $70 million towards providing better access for uh, behavioral and, and, and physical health. Uh, and behavioral health is another way of saying mental health. Um, and the first way we're gonna do that is to do a countywide health assessment. Uh, we're going to provide somewhere between 60 and 70 million dollars for economic development, and those are for small business resources, main street initiatives, and site readiness programs. Uh, I think you know the negotiated package of, of, of tax incentives that the MEDC is talking about. I, I know it's an NDA; it's not a huge secret. They're talking about a billion dollar package for site readiness, and and we're thinking about putting money towards site readiness as well. Uh, we're talking somewhere between 60 and 70 million dollars for infrastructure projects. Not just below ground infrastructure, but road projects, especially if the Senate bill passes that allows for that flexibility. Uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 million dollars on parks and trails. Uh, somewhere between uh, 50 and 70 million dollars on workforce development initiatives. We're working very closely with our three community colleges here in Wayne County, who also received about 80, 81, 81 and a half million dollars. And then uh, housing, somewhere between 40 and 60 million dollars in housing. Um, you know, what I will say is we do have one program out there right now, the Rental Assistance Program. Uh, we really need your help on getting the word out on the Rental Assistance Program. Uh, at Mackinac, the county executive announced $20 million to put towards rental assistance. And this will help uh, people who are on their back rent um, going backwards about 15 months, possibly even going forward three months. Uh, and it's not just for rent, it's for rent, it's for water, it's for utilities, it's for internet. And we have invested internally to make sure that you know, we make it as easy for the applicant as possible, meaning that if it's a water bill that they need paid, we will pay the municipality directly, which means we will pay you directly for their water bills if they're back paid. We will pay the landlord directly. We will pay the utility company directly. Um, and we have a steady flow of 100, 150 applications a week. Um, we have a significant denial rate because a lot of those applications are coming from Detroit, and, and Detroit received their own pot of funds. They have their own program. 
So we really got to get the word out on, on this program. Uh, I've been talking with Congresswoman Dingell about the fact that in her, some of her hearings, you know, if money doesn't get spent, sometimes the federal government will do an audit and reallocate some of the funds. And that, that is exactly how the rental assistance program is written. And what that means is that if we spend a significant amount of those dollars, we could get more. And if we don't spend, they could take it away. And so, uh, you know, we really have, and we have a flyer on this. We have all the information on our website. Um, I, I, we're, everybody's going to get uh, sort of an email with our ARPA presentation that we've given to the commissioners and our rental assistance program for you all to shove out as, as, as best as you can. And we could really, really use the help to get our word out on that. The, the last thing I will say is, you know, I, I know uh, patience is never anything that we like to hear uh, in, in a lot of these things. But what I will say is we have, according to the legislation, two more years to obligate these funds, and we have four years to spend the dollars. And the reason why I think that's significant, last year during the CARES Act, Wayne County needed about eight months to spend somewhere in the vicinity of $250 million. And that was a combination of CARES, HUD, and FEMA dollars. And all of them had different regulations, and all of them had different auditing rules, and all of them had different programming. And you all know many of your communities were the beneficiaries of small business grants, nonprofit grants, $500 debit cards. We received awards for how we spent some of that money. And so if we can spend $250 million uh, in eight months, I'm very confident that our staff, particularly you know, our fiscal staff, which has done an amazing job over the last six, seven years that we've been in office, can spend our 339, help you all draw down your funds to do transformational projects together in the time that we have. So, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. This doesn't have to be the only time we have to talk. Trust me, I'm readily accessible to, to all of you. I encourage you all to please come to our one o'clock uh, where you will see the actual presentation and get more details and, and you can call me anytime. Thank you. I'm just curious, the $339 million, is that including uh, Detroit or did Detroit get a separate sum? Detroit received 826 of their own. We received 339. Collectively, the other 42 communities combined got about 222. The two community colleges got somewhere about 81 and a half. I'm confused. So you have 200, how much do you have for the 41 communities outside of Detroit? So there's 43 communities in Wayne County. Okay, sorry. And, and Detroit, if you took Detroit out of it, because Detroit got 826 sure. million, the rest of the 42 combined municipalities, not including school districts, by the way, just the, just the municipalities, they got about 222. 222, okay. Yeah. They went directly to each individual city, yeah. I could, I could tell you, you know, Dearborn got- I meant got, the money that you have. You had 339. We have, the county received 339 of our own. Yeah. Of your own that- Directly is, to us. Is gonna be dispersed within Detroit also? Well, we're gonna accept projects from everywhere. Some of the programmings that we'll do, for instance, uh, you know, we may do a small business program that may okay. be countywide. Okay. We may do a workforce development program that may be countywide. Okay. We're not restricted from spending money in Detroit. Okay. Yeah. It's just very tough to compete with Detroit. Don't so, I know it. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it, Ben. Appreciate it. Okay. Do we have any elected officials' comments today? Hi. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation. It was real informative. I just want to. Um, you talked about mental health a little bit, and I just want to talk about what happened yesterday in Plymouth Canton Schools. Um, and it kind of follows on the steps of this, but my daughter, she's 16 years old, and she goes to Plymouth Canton Schools, and she's talking about a party that she's going to have. She's, uh, her, her text to me at 1249 was, hey, Mom, can you throw me a party? And when I walk in, everyone say surprise. And then uh, 50 minutes later, I'm sending, getting sent text saying, Mom, we're in lockdown. What's going on? Uh, Mom, police are coming into the room with guns. They're checking our bags. They're going through everything. An hour later, how long is this going to be? Um, there's people are talking about guns in the school, someone running through. Is someone going to come in and shoot us? What's going on? I mean, I sat, stood outside yesterday with parents who were on their knees praying and crying. And I can't tell you, 
just over the past week what this region has been going through, let alone what we went through yesterday. I also, I guess, I want to start with just saying my police chief sent something to us this morning, and I want to thank the, um, the communities that helped us. Police officers and agents responded from as far as Clarkston, Bloomfield, Inkster, Detroit, Dearborn, Washtenaw, Wayne, Westland, Northville, Plymouth, Van Buren, all over southeastern Michigan. It was like a, it was like a war zone. We had the, the incident command was right at the school, so there were police and canines coming in from everywhere. This is um, something that unfortunately has become our normal. Um, parents were screaming that there were guns in the school. They were talking about texting to their kids to just run out, get out and run. And I, I, had, I found myself, because I um, can have a phone to my police chief, I kind of know what is happening. So I'm talking to parents out of having their kids run out of the school in the situation, um, telling them that there are, is no gunfire. Things are not, nobody's been shot, it's okay and just trying to keep people calm while keeping myself calm. But I think, I mean, our youth have been disconnected over the past two years. We've seen that with the misbehavior, some of the things we're talking about. We're seeing a mental health crisis. Um, we have a social worker now. We hired our first social worker in Canton. That social worker gets 90 cases a week and she's trying to triage and she just can't keep up. Our communities are in crisis. I don't think any of you are not seeing this. Um, our police are passing as much as they can to the social worker, but they have to still be social workers themselves because there's just not enough. We can keep prosecuting these kids, but there's still these kids and these families are still in trauma. They're still in crisis. And while we talk about giving money to the mental health, the social worker is telling me that the biggest thing she's seeing is that we don't have long-term mental health care for some of these people. We actually lost a policeman in our um, in Canton community also this year to a gun that had been purchased over the counter with no background check. Someone just walked in, took a hunting rifle, and came home and killed him. So we've felt this in Canton extensively this year, especially after what happened last year. I mean, yeah, last night. But I want to say we can join in the prayers and vigils, but even more, we need to push for these gaps in mental health we're seeing, and not just more social workers and psychologists that can see people one-on-one, -on -one, but we need extensive health care, whether that means trauma, more at a ground level, but um, I think this group can do that, and I think we really need to. Yesterday was very scary. My daughter came home and said she's never going back to school. Um, I'm hoping that that changes over the next couple of days, but I don't know how to tell her any different because I couldn't sleep all night. I just kept going into her room and checking on her. So I'm asking you to really think about this because I know what I felt last night and I had a kind of in the know what was happening. I can't even imagine those around me. I just watched them fall apart. And so I really ask that more of this money, whether it's with the ARPA funds or other funds, that we solve this at the ground level. We have to start somewhere, I know, and just keep moving up and asking for money. But thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? In light, in light of that, the Detroit Wayne County Mental Health Authority, I sit on their board, they do have funds and they do have, they do provide um, um, mental health professionals to the local schools. Um, they, quite frankly, have put the, put the request out to all of our school systems, but only about, I'd say, 20 school systems, and I mean, we're, we've got probably 50 in, this, in the, uh, Wayne County, have asked for them. So there is room there for more mental health professionals, and it's free. Anybody else? I share in uh, Supervisor Graham Hudak's frustration with this. This is a second lockdown for Plymouth Canton schools in the past six days, and they don't have school today as well. Our education system in Western Wayne is linked directly to the economic vitality of this region. It's extremely important. When the schools are disrupted, our entire communities are disrupted, and future planning becomes extremely difficult. The threat of gun violence to our school, in our schools, is unique. It is something that we've struggled as a state to deal with, to make, to make efforts to challenge this. It's getting worse. I think that this board is going to have a chance to take a look at some legislation that's going to be proposed in Lansing. I encourage us to take a look at that and seriously consider how legislation that is associated with the threat of gun violence in our schools is important to the economic vitality of this community going forward. It's really important. Thank you. Anyone else? OK. 
Okay. several federal task forces, Department of Homeland and Security, etc. There's basically two things that are common in all of these. There's a mental health or social fitness issue, and somebody knew about it. Somebody somewhere, whether it was a friend, peer, family, people knew that somebody was, was all of a sudden having difficulties. When I was with Dearborn, Chief Haddad had spirited a working group that worked with, with some, some of the uh, psychiatric people from all over the country, and they came up with what was called the Non-Criminal Mental Health Intervention Plan. And originally it was, tar it was targeted towards school systems. And it would be really something if the CWW as, a, as an entity could take some of what was built on from there, come up with a uniform uh, 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 plan to be able to do this, and, and what this plan essentially did is, is it developed a, a, a matrix with some algorithms, et cetera, and it came up with a initial, like, I would say evaluation form that teachers, counselors, et cetera, people who worked in the schools were trained on these things. All of a sudden, if a teacher recognizes that all of a sudden this student who was A's and B's is now all of a sudden <coughs> C's and D's and coming to school, dressed disheveled compared to their normal immaculate, you know, when they start to see issues, they, they're, through this form, they start looking at these different questions. What's going on? What's happening? And as that goes on, if, if the algorithm meets a certain score that, that, okay, maybe we need to do something else. Well, the, the plan in Dearborn is, is that at some point you would call in law enforcement. And the whole reason for the model of non-criminal is to, number one, you're starting to bridge the gap between the kids and law enforcement so everything's not enforcement based. But number two, you're looking at a non-criminal way and, and who is the best to, to conduit communications and bringing social help and, and different, different entities than the police who are out there 24 seven dealing with these things. They're a very good conduit of information and coordinator of programs. And what would happen is then the police would, would become involved then when the police are involved, they go through a little bit more elaborate evaluation with different questions. And then it, it, based on scores, et cetera, um, it, it, and, and Dr. Barnes is the one who was working on these algorithms and it, it, from U of D Mercy, and he's very difficult. You know, to me, when he talks, my brain hurts because it's, it's such, at such a high level. But when you reach that, then we have to develop a list of participating social services that are already, that we're all familiar with, that we all have access to, that it's a, it's a simple phone call to get the ball rolling, whether it's a family intervention or it's, or you know, I know in Belleville, if I came into this issue, I'd be reaching out to Growth Works and their programs. I'd be reaching out to these different things. And the whole premise of, of, of an idea like this is to try to intervene before the critical issues occur. There's no way of knowing really if it's ever truly effective because how do you measure something, a tragedy that doesn't happen? But I, I, I tell you that we spent a lot of time on that model when I was in Dearborn and, and we had it. It was vetted by Johns Hopkins, it was vetted by USC, it was vetted by U of M. It was vetted by all these different programs and they were all supportive. And, Dearborn has been successful in semi-integrating that program because you really got to have the buy-in from the school systems, et cetera, to, to be involved. But if that, there's something that we could look at, something we could examine to expand on that and make it a entity-wide where all the communities are kind of doing the same thing, following the same protocols. It's the same educational model. It's the same training model for teachers, counselors, staff, and, and I think that, you know, I know that people talk about funding this and funding that. Sometimes it just takes some, you know, like elbow grease to get people involved and, and, and people willing to sit down and then analyze these because we all know people, we all have connections with the greatest minds in this realm that we should be tapping. And, and it's not necessarily a funding issue. 
it is a an ideal or approach to where we outline what our goals and objectives our strategic plan with a program like this as an entity and then that's where you if, if it requires funding that's when you seek the funding for that and, and I'm just I'm just throwing that out there this is kind of like my first meeting in this chair because my mayor's on but these are things I'm very passionate about I mean it, it is this is this is something that we can't buy our way out of. This is not something we can fund this to fund that. And there are so many things, just like um, um, Supervisor McNamara just mentioned, there are mental health resources and people don't know how to use them or get to use them. And, and, and like the gentleman who spoke before when he was talking about the rental assistance programs, you know, we hear about them here or there, but we really have to research them. And he says, you got to get it out to your community. That's what we have to do. And it's like, there are resources. It's just, I don't think we are getting it knocked into our brain enough that here's the resources, here's the ease of using it. And and I tell you, in, in dealing with, with the, the, the grant systems and putting in for the grants that I did through the, through the ARPA and through, through the, the wish list, basically, from Wayne County, I found it extremely streamlined. I was very, very impressed. They they call me all the time. Hey, listen, this is how we could write this better. They're, they're very, very good. Uh, I mean, I've been very, very impressed with Wayne County and how they're doing these things. But this is an idea for a program that us as an entity could develop and really help the whole, all of the county, all of the cities and municipalities in Western Wayne. I just wanna put that out there because I know Everybody here, there, this is a very, very impressive body of, of minds. And if we could all think about these things and come up with ideas together, I think we could come up with a, you're never gonna solve these problems, but if we can mitigate them before they become a problem, I think that's something we should consider. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Sorry, just as a follow up. I agree with you that we need programs like that and we do have the school Plymouth Kent Schools does have something called the okay to say but our social worker who is an expert and knows where resources is are, is telling me that the programs are full and there's not enough beds in places where she does find them so we do know that even the resources that are there are at a strain so that is something that we have to expand on also okay. yes we have that at Plymouth Kent Schools and it's very, very difficult from a law enforcement side because you get a partial tip in, in order to be able to follow up or get any other information because of the anonymity that there, it literally takes a, a petition to the attorney general's office and, and by that time, you're two weeks or three weeks before you would ever even be able to speak to a tipster. And, you know, I understand the need that, that the students need to be anonymous, but there is like zero way to follow up on these things. And I know that the resources we're spending in the Van Buren school system to try to track down every single one of these is, is immense. So if there's any better ideas, I'm, I'm all ears. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Public comment? Anybody in the public? Yes. Uh, Please come to the podium. I dressed up for you guys today. <laughs> I don't know how to wear a tie anymore. Uh, your comments were spot on. In a different life, I used to work for Ford Motor Company, research engineering. I was an EAP employee assistance rep, and we worked with what they call a central diagnostic and referral agency. And what we would do, we tried to treat mental health like we do physical health. And we, as a society, don't do that. But that even the doctors would refer all their mental health and their substance abuse people to me. And I had to fast track with the CDR, Central Diagnostic Referral Agency, and also the local hospitals. And we got a lot of folks some treatment. Um, and so I was thinking about that, what you're saying, it's so actually correct. There's a difference between uh, ham and eggs. Uh, the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed if you have ham and eggs. So if you're committed to this and you get a model like the one that Ford's had back in the 80s, a central diagnostic referral agency, 
and then you had quick resources, you know, to those agencies. It's continual education. I burnt myself out in eight, eight years of that. But, but the thing of it is, if you, if, if you want to look at a model like that, um, it's doable. It's very doable. And you can make a difference in this state and even this country. But uh, you have to, and I'd be glad at some other time, because it's pretty deep to get into that. But, um, but that model worked for Ford Motor Company for a number of years. And, and anyway, then I noticed at some point they quit doing the 28-day residential program for substance abuse, and they cut, cut it down to three days, and you go in a hospital and get well enough to get bad again. So I've seen all that without getting into all that today. The, the main reason I wanted to talk to you is, uh, and I credit Khalil and, and the administration of Wayne County for helping me. I personally uh, was uh, working with my staff and others to distribute about 6,000 masks since this COVID started. Uh, I still got them in my truck. I got masks everywhere. And, and I, could, I could use some more, Khalil. Uh, but the thing of it is, um, wearing a mask, getting your shots. I've had three shots. Uh, I had my flu shot, but in educating folks, it's a continual process. I post the numbers on Facebook every day when I get them of Out County, not Detroit, but Out County. And I noticed the numbers go up, and yesterday they actually started going down a little bit. So, but as leaders of communities, if you start posting that and start telling people, I even have certain family members that won't get the shot. They have misinformation. And so we have a, a responsibility as elected officials to actually continue to try to educate them and look where the numbers are high. You know, I got great friends like brothers in Dearborn and their numbers were going like this, worse than out county. And then they start getting their shots and stuff, but still the young people won't get their shots. So I would encourage you to, you know, uh, work with other electeds uh, to uh, get people to get their shots, educate people. Let's get over this mess and let's move on. But, but if you look at the numbers every day and look at your own communities, you know whether you're doing okay or not. And let's not point fingers at each other. Let's start working with each other to try to get this done because I like having uh, dinner in different towns or having shopping in this town or that town. We can't do that if we're always like this and you need to stay home and be careful. So I would encourage people to you know, find out what the numbers are every day as elected officials and do what you can to get the mask out and to get the education out about getting their shots. And I'll shut up my pie hole. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. That was my colleague. I noticed he didn't introduce himself, but maybe you all already know him. <laughs> I, I'm Wayne County Commissioner Monique Baker McCormick. Just wanted to introduce myself uh, to you. Uh, I am the chair uh, of Health and Human Services. And very early on in the pandemic, uh, I sponsored a resolution to talk to mental health because we knew uh, then that it would be an issue with people being locked in and locked up, um, that you know we would come out of it and we would have some health challenges, some mental health challenges. Um, in addition, uh, we talked to testing because testing is key into, in understanding um, who uh, is a carrier of, of uh, COVID. And so um, I want to also uh, implore that there are going to be resources for free testing kits for the public. And that should, you should have more information on that soon. But again, I'm Monique Baker McCormick and uh, I am in my second term on the commission. So thank you. Thank you. Chief. Oh. Hello, briefly, uh, my name is Chief Jeff Jodrusik. I'm representing the Wayne County Association of Chiefs of Police. And just briefly, I wanted to expand a little bit um, more on some of the concerns that we're seeing from our from our region is just basically, to simplify it, is a form of like a resource fair. Is, and there's people from the county here that I'd like to potentially work with is all of our departments, um, 
are kind of searching for resources. And an example I'll give is, you know, Canton might have a program that's, that's beneficial to the department, but it's not full. And other departments are in a position where, you know, we could use a resource, but we're just not a, um, um, completely aware that that program is out there. So what we're talking about at the, at the county level with the chiefs is that a way to put together a form of like a resource fair to simplify it, that these are the resources that are out there. Um, that way, you know, for example, Monday, I have my social worker starting in our department, and the first thing we're tasking her with is to research options that we can use um, for the problems that we're having. And the biggest uh, call for service numbers that all our departments have are family troubles. Every family trouble has a different source, whether it's a gambling addiction problem, it's alcohol, it's drugs. So what police departments need is through our social workers is when we do identify what the problem is, the family trouble, what then we're gonna do with it. And um, I know we talk about all the different fundings, but at some point, even simplifying, simplifying a program through the county, whether it's just a, a way to pull together these resources that are, are now being shared with the different communities so we all know they are available and we're all taking full advantage of them is something I think that we need to kind of work together as a group with the county on too, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Congresswoman. Good morning. I, I was going to talk about one subject, but I was talking to Colleen and Rashida and I were talking on the way here. I think I'm going to hit several of them. I'll start with the mental health and the schools. Look, the reality is we have two different problems in the schools right now. We have, um, I, I, I met with students last Friday. I was flew in and made it by the skin of my teeth for a vigil some of the other students did last night. And I like had somebody that was a teacher that was very close that was in the school last night. We have kids, period, that are just scared to go to school. I mean, that is, the kids last Friday from Dearborn said that they had been given an all clear but showed me pictures that one person's in the classroom because they're just physically scared to go to school. And part of it is, you know, Tony, I don't know if you're going to talk about all the things that you're doing in that, but I think yesterday the number was there were 23 that had been prosecuted, another nine pending, and that didn't include anything from yesterday. So we have kids that think it's funny. They don't want to go to school, and they have no idea of the psychological impact that they're doing. And perhaps the, but then we have kids and families that need mental health resources. It's been a subject nobody wants to talk to about for too long. I, as I heard some of you talk, I, look, I talk about my own family now because I'm trying to take the stigma off mental health issues. Uh, there was a situation, if you all recall, at Central University where a young man knew he had a problem, went to the emergency room. There was no bed. They discharged him. His parents came to get him, and he took his parents' gun and killed his parents. That, was, I, that made me dig like no one's ever done. There are no beds. Now, I know that when my sister, who ultimately did not make it, needed help, I couldn't get help. I could, the way the laws are written, there are family members that need help, and if they're over a certain age, you can't do anything, and you don't know the desperateness of that. We gotta address that. But there are no beds in this region when people need help, and doctors aren't going into psychiatry. So there are such a multitude of issues. We gotta take the stigma, we gotta look at potentially doing resources, and we all have to, and I want to say one other thing. Our kids are a reflection of community too. The hate and the division and the fear in some of our communities is we, our children are reflecting that. And we all got to work together to bring our communities together. We can disagree agreeably, but we have got to bring civility back because that's part of what is happening too. And you see it when you look at the home, I mean, we don't know all the facts, we've got to be careful of even this young man from Oxford and what was happening. And we, I know, all, Haley, Rashida, and I talk constantly about what to do about mental health. So that's that issue. Um, Colleen, uh, I'll go to an easier one, uh, reminded me to tell you all we have a continuing resolution that will now go until like, uh, February 14th. And a lot of you have community projects that are included in that. We are still hopeful that those community projects will get funded in the next bill that happens um, after the 14th. I'm going backwards from where I was gonna go. Economic development. I, this has become 
want to, I, I, you, you don't know exactly what the dollars are because we need to get that project here. We are not getting projects in Michigan. I have talked to, I've talked to Stellantis, GM, Ford, LG, SK, Toyota, uh, and they're all bring, building battery plants. They're all building bigger plants, and Michigan hasn't been on the radar for any of them. And I, I've got uh, steel, uh, U.S. Steel is building a big mill. They, they, we're not getting projects we need to. And if we don't get some of these battery plants, we are losing generations of jobs for the state of Michigan. And I've been very, well, you know me when I get intense. I've been talking to the governor, and, I, and I've talked to all the companies. We have to get one. I, I, happen, I haven't signed the agreement, but I do know what it's. I'm one of the people that's, you know, vehement that we need to get it. And we all have auto plants in our area. We're going to miss a couple more. I've already been told by people because we weren't ready. We have to work with MEDC and Khalil. Khalil hears me yell at him about this every week. Um, <laughs> but we all, and I'll tell you something. When I, I was, you know, there are a couple really big ones. We shouldn't have lost Ford. We shouldn't have lost the LG. LG said to me, it was the first time, other states line up. They pull out the red carpet. You don't know if anybody's Republican or Democrat. They want you. The communities want you. They, that's what we all got to do. We got to work at the, at the federal, state, and local level to protect. Rashida reminds me regularly about we got to protect our communities. But we also need to get those jobs. And we got to work together. So we need to get with MEDC and Khalil. And because I happen, I'm not giving anything away. This Western Wayne area, we're not going to get one that's going to be announced shortly, but should be in the mix for another battery plant for somebody we all care about. We got to work together on that, and we got to do it together. We got to do this economic development together. Now, when it comes to um, the federal dollars, both from the American Recovery Plan and from the infrastructure bill, I'm a little more worried than Khalil is because I keep setting the meetings where people want to give away the dollars that haven't been spent and take it to apply it to something else. So I do think it's important that we help this, you know, all of you have gotten dollars that you can spend. There's a chicken and egg here um, uh, of what's going to get done, county versus city. I think all of us want to work with you to protect the dollars that you have and figure out how they're going to be spent. And I do believe so does Colleen. I don't think Treasury is going to give much more guidance on the American Recovery Dollar programs. I think they think they're out there. If you all have questions, we will, as we do this, send letters to Treasury seeking clarification and try to get that as quickly as possible. Because I fear we're going to lose dollars if we don't at least dedicate them sooner than later. I said that to Khalil on Tuesday, and I walked out of that, or I was on the phone, text you know, whatever we do, Zoom. And I walked from there to a rules committee meeting and people immediately started taking, talking about dollars not spent from the American Recovery problem, uh, Program and putting them into something else. The infrastructure dollars are going to be one of the most incredible opportunities we've seen in decades uh, in this state. They're going to come in, there are a million programs, they're going to come in a lot of different ways. Um, some are going to come in, but so there's roads money, there's bridge money, there's infrastructure money for both the lead pipes, water, you know, and even, I'm going to tell you, the reason why Wayne County has, well, it has more water money than many other areas because Rashida and I were pains in the asses, and I was actually a bigger pain in the ass than she was on this one. She tried to get me to behave. I wanted the White House to declare water shut up. This is a true story. Well, you know, I think they declared it a... Um, National Health, the CDC said, you know, um, evictions were uh, uh, a uh, health crisis. And I was like, water is even more so. So if you can do that, why can't you get water? It's a human right. Every human being needs to have access to water. And uh, I thought the CDC should have done that. And they instead called Khalil and made sure that he had all the money he needed for water so Rashida and I would quit being so intense. But, and it didn't stop either of us, just for the record. Um, but that is a true story, is it not, Rashida? She was, she said, Debbie, you gotta calm down. They said yes. And she still was like, do it now. And I was like, they said yes, it's coming. 
<laughs> so I'm always fighting for you. So, but that, but um, some of the money is going to come in by the regular road formula that the state gets. But a lot of them, there are also going to be grant programs. The, each of the agencies is writing that right now. All of us, we're going to work together. The one thing I want to tell you is your congressional delegation is going to work together because, you know, each, we all represent you. But we, I think you can see we talk, and that's why we really made a point to be here today. One, they're going to, so it's going to come out. So we're, so the road dollar will be both road formula, but then for special projects, DOT will be doing grants. And one of the criteria every agency is going to have, be it for roads, be it for bridges, be it for special projects, you know, when you talk about, there's going to be money in there for trails and, um, uh, and parks. There's going to, the, right now, all of us are doing this as, uh, right, uh, Khalil told us at a meeting this week, or Assad, I can't remember which one, that there were seven cities that have been identified with lead in their pipes. We want to go through, we are as a delegation looking at every community. How are we going to make sure that money is going to get there? How is it going to be spent? And we are working with the state and staying right on top of them. EPA is going to be doing a grant program. Criteria for every one of them is going to be regional cooperation. You're going to have to, and when the EPA administrator was here uh, this summer and we were at uh, the water, uh, he, somebody, well, that shall go nameless, but a regional figure, you all know, not represented in this room, talked about what he was going to do, and I said, that's, it's going to be based on, it's going to be a competitive process and on regional cooperation, and EPA administrator said, Debbie Dingle and the Congressionals are right. That's how you're going to get the money. So I, after the floods in June, I said to all of you, everybody said, oh, good, will the infrastructure money help us and make us resilient? We're not going to get those dollars if we don't know what we're spending them on. And we got to be ready to get out that door and know what we're doing. Now, after I said that, uh, the governor's office with SEMCOG and many of the groups that you have been working to get those projects prioritized, but we really got to, we, we got to be ready. I mean, I, we don't, Khalil knows, I think, that the, he's doing these one o'clock meetings, and I do work with him. I'm not being a, well, I am being a pain in his ass, but, um, but we do work together. And I, I really, I want to reinforce that, that everybody needs to know what their projects are. We got to, some's going to be at the state, some's going to be through federal grants. We're trying to figure out what does the state legislature have to approve when we wrote this bill, I said to the White House, having experienced the American recovery dollars, make as much as this money eligible to go right to a community and not have to get approved by a state legislature. So and all those rules are being promulgated right now by each of the agencies that's going to have the money. This is a long way of saying we all got to really work together. And even as you guys are talking about writing grants, et cetera, I bet, and, and writing your grants and getting the resources and knowing what the resources are, I've been working with mutual aid at the DCC about how we help them on the COPS grants and uh, FIRE has asked for the same kind of meeting. We probably should do a joint meeting with the DCC and Western Wayne on all the, well, I know we need COP grants and what the, what the mutual aid societies, both sides need, and then we all need to help support you and what's that going and when you, we all need to do letters of support for the projects you're asking. How, uh, all of these grants, a lot of them are being done on regional cooperation showing that. I think more than we've ever needed it, we have an opportunity right now to spend dollars that will never be here again. You haven't seen dollars like this since um, the New Deal in the 40s. We can't blow it and everybody will be enhanced by supporting each other that we have to work together. We got to get a process by which we are all working with you and being focused and detailed, and it needs to happen at the federal, state, county, and local level. And did I forget anything? Rashida can come up too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Congresswoman Dingle, and everyone that she represents know she's extremely tenacious. Um, and that's good because it's contagious and it gets me going. So thank you so much for just an amazing work that you've done. And thank you for saying yes, let's work on water together. And I really appreciate all your help. Um, 
One of the things I do want uh, everyone to know um, is, you know, City of Wayne already contacted me. If you're in my community, reach out. I know uh, Redford Township and regarding some of the infrastructure issues because it's going to be competitive grant process of what's coming down. It's going to go through the similar formulas. And so it is, this is the time to be ready, shovel ready and all this kind of things. I know Khalil knows that I, I really want a pre-application process thanks to uh, the mayor and giving us um, kind of a heads up that this would be helpful in regards to which communities will be able to get access to the lead service line uh, money, and not only through ARPA, but also through the Violet Park Infrastructure Bill, because it isn't enough. It's only 25% of the total funding we really need for the whole country. And so please uh, work with our offices in that regard. I just talked to the folks in the eCourse Creek Coalition. They just applied for Eagle Grant. I'm gonna call and be tenacious, and we're both doing it together to make sure, again, our communities in Western Wayne are at the forefront in getting these dollars. And again, it's gonna be highly competitive. This is the way to use our office, the power of our letterhead, to make sure that we have, you know, that you all are a priority for much of these dollars. Again, and you, Mayor, you know this, it's gonna be competitive. Not all the money for some of the smaller communities comes directly to all of you. You are sometimes relying on the county and the state. And so, even though we get it done on the federal level, uh, implementation matters and so please bring us along with that because I, I I love that we're, people focus on the dollar amount and it has to be a high amount but honestly it is the implementation of whether or not it's equitable and it's accessible to all of you so please use our offices for that and getting also clarification I love that we brought up the issue around you know how do we reimagine how we can be safe in our communities I think it's something that I'm very passionate about. I'm a social worker at heart um, and it's programs like CAHOOTS that we see in other communities where they brought, um, it's a great program, it started in 1989 and now it's being picked up in communities like Texas. Uh, and that's what I wanna help fund. You know, this was an amazing response where they improved the city's response to mental illness, substance abuse and homelessness. Cause you can't police away those things. And so it was great because the local police came together with the fire department and to mental health agencies together in the city city level, local level, and dispersed, and it was great because, again, it was those folks that were able to respond to some of those, you know, I would call social issues or family dynamics, whatever that's going on, uh, it is important. And as a mother of a 16-year-old, I can tell you the issue regarding, and we can call mental health and all these things, but our kids are struggling with coping, coping skills under stress of everything, not only the pandemic, but we need to figure out how, again, we disperse and think about that in our school system because we have now more policing going on versus nurses versus social workers in our schools and that's a reality look it up it's factual so we got to figure out how do we shift how do we get a good balance because again i'll tell you i don't think our i don't think we're prepared to understand by getting away from those investments i had three counselors in my high school we had what 1500 students at southwestern we had three counselors we have now sometimes one for three. And that's just one example of one of my dis school districts. A lot of our school districts have them, but guess what? The social workers are being pulled to do administrative work too. No, we need folks specifically checking in. And we used to be assigned. That was your, you had to check in with that counselor. And again, if it wasn't for Coach Perry Watson, honestly, I would walk the hallways. He knew when I was down, he was like, come here, what's going on? You know, and, and it was amazing because he even pulled me in, made me sit down. I don't know if you folks know Bill. He made me sit down and like handwrite my college applications because I was like, I can't go to school. I'm the eldest of 14. I'm just giving you examples. These are things that our kids truly need is that hands-on approach. And it's bringing back that model counselors that we all experienced. It was taken away from our schools in our school district and we know it. Uh, and we di disinvested in that model and said, okay, we're gonna, we need to do cuts let's cut here, let's cut here, and let's cut here, let's cut all the wraparound services. And so we gotta get back to that model. Lastly, um, uh, anything we can do to help you become shovel ready. I know what's gonna happen. The guidance is gonna come down and then we're gonna go 90 miles per hour. Get prepared, be ready. I want Western Wayne at the forefront so that when other communities come in, like, nope, we already have the application information out to the county. We have our proposals in. You, again, use our offices for that. Uh, you know, um, and I'll check in with uh, Garden City again, but we have that center. We want to make sure the facility like that, which was key to stopping the spread of COVID in Garden City. Like people don't realize, it's not just about a building. It was the key center and anchor of where everyone went for testing and, and, and shots. So we got to not talk about them as facilities. 
They were anchors in stopping the spread of COVID. That's how we gotta talk about it, because it's true. And so we're gonna work hard to make sure it's at the forefront. So again, use our offices. Uh, I love being able to not only get the bill passed, or at least advocate for getting the bill passed in some sort of way with Bill Back Better. But one of the things that we need to do is watch the money get implemented in a way that I think that is that can make a huge difference. And again, uh, it, it won't change people's lives if it doesn't hit the ground at the local community, especially our smaller communities. Um, but with that, again, push us, rely on us. Um, and again, uh, we'll double trouble, uh, as people will say, but we're really good at it. Um, uh, and I'm not bragging about it, but I we really think People don't realize how little some of the Treasury folks get engaged from their members of Congress, but they hear from us. And all of a sudden, it's like we're one of maybe a dozen that contacted about a specific issue. And all of a sudden, Michigan becomes one of the lead folks on water. And we're going to show everybody how to get lead out of water in our country. We're going to be the ones to birth that movement. This is how it's done. And look, we eliminated water, uh, lead out of our water. And, you know, we can't build better. With children being poisoned with lead. And that's sad to say, but it's true. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. No, I have a great comment. You know, with everything that I've heard, I mean, it's very disturbing to hear that story about the school. And uh, so a few days ago, we were in a meeting. Uh, one of the schools, we also had threats in Dearborn Heights, uh, several schools. So we had a meeting with the uh, county sheriff, uh, also state police, emergency management from Wayne County. Um, it, it is very disturbing to see what our youth are going through. And you know, this is probably the worst, uh, the pandemic is the worst that I think I've ever experienced here in the US. You know, you see stuff like that overseas. I've traveled overseas, did multiple tours overseas with the military. So you don't expect it here in the US. But with, with the situation that we have, I mean, I agree mental health is a huge issue. Uh, just to give you an example, yesterday I talked to one of my uh, engineers. I actually mentored her for the last you know, eight years. She worked for Ford Motor Company. I was an engineer also at Ford Motor Company. She's taken it really hard, you know, with the pandemic, that the isolation that she's working, you know, at home and not having the interaction with others. So this, she's an adult. So imagine the youth. So go back, you know, a year or so back. Um, one of the one of the kids, you know, came up to me, a high school kid. And he said, hey, uh, you know, Bill, you know, you're, uh, you're a Marine, right? I said, well, you know, I'm a retired Marine. He goes, you know martial arts, right? I said, well, you know, they taught us, you know, martial arts, we do jiu-jitsu. He goes, can you train me? And I'm like, you know, it was very disturbing for this kid to come up to me. And you can tell there was something not right. So I asked him, I said, well, you know, first I want to ask you, well, what's the reason? And one thing that we haven't touched about today is uh, bullying. So I remember several years ago with Dearborn, uh, we, there was an initiative with you when I was chief of that, and we were actually having uh, an, an initiative with anti-bullying program. So this kid actually was bullied so much by his school, and the teachers and everybody, uh, according to this kid, was, was aware of the issue, but nobody did anything. And the reason why he was being bullied is because of who he was, his ethnicity, even the way he dressed. I've experienced it, you know, growing up. You know, I immigrated to the US, I was 12 years old. So I was bullied too. Maybe, I don't know if that was the reason I joined the Marines, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, with that, you know, I know the feeling, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, you know, kids, you know, they do get out, whatever, and you know, after that, you know, everything's okay. And I heard that yesterday from uh, somebody from the police force. But today, I mean, people have access, you know, <coughs> parents, or somebody's, uh, I don't want to bash some parents, but the ones who purchase weapons and they're not locking their weapons or whatever kids have access to weapons. Um, so one of the things that we have to go back and look at is the bullying initiatives. And you know, one of the things that we do is uh, we concentrate. We're not proactive, not us, but you know, people like say like schools. You know, they put their guards down, they get complacent, but they never go back and they say, okay, you know what, let's go to the root cause. As an engineer, that's one of the things you always look at, the root cause of an issue. You know, why did this kid do something? Yeah, it was a mental issue, the mental health. But also, what, what was the reason why the person did what they did, like in Oxford, or, you know, several other incidents that I followed. And it's always, you know, the root cause is that kid was being bullied. It's, there's no excuse for it. But the thing is, you know, people have to be engaged and I've been doing a lot of initiatives with youth for the last several years, and I've seen a lot of that pattern. You know, some kids, they want to become part of 
you know, other groups like the Key Club, the National Honor Society, so they can feel like they belong to something. So I think this is something maybe as a CSWW can start an initiative or a process as a prime improvement that we think of and prime improvement that we think of and about a process that everybody can follow. And I've seen, we have three school districts in our city. So I've seen like each district is doing something different with the schools. So I think, you know, maybe as a community that we can get together and, you know, have some type of a process that everybody can follow. But we can discuss that another time. But this is some of the biggest issues. You know, growing up, some of the stuff that I've experienced and some of the stuff that I've seen recently with you that I've been engaged with is fully, that's a big topic. And I think that's a good cause. Maybe not the only root cause, but that's a big issue that we have with our schools. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, j just a couple comments as we've sat here today, and I, I sit here in a room full of fixers. Um, I think it ultimately becomes frustrating when we hear so many issues that we can't quite get our arms around, like school violence yet. We don't know where the solution resides just yet. And we look at things where we need to do so much future planning, like how are we going to uh, allocate and spend and find ways to use the American Recovery Plan money, issues like how are we going to you know, best plan and prepare for treating our, our water system. And yet, I, I think that um, there is something, as a room full of fixers, that we can pay attention to and help to mitigate today. And that is the spread of COVID as we look coming back out of the holiday season. Um, in the city of Livonia, we're really focused on the 14 days after we come back um, because we really understand that, you know, uh, about 30% of our workforce has resigned themselves that they're not going to get vaccinated. Approximately 50% of the workforce um, has not gotten that booster. Um, so, you know, we still have a percentage of people that we need to encourage to get that booster shot. But so what we're looking at, and I want to encourage all of you to look at too, is going back to your safe start plans and stepping back a beat. Um, you know, we've, in the city of Livonia now, we're gonna reinstitute the mask mandate for a certain period of time um, in our public buildings. Um, we're gonna put back into place the temperature checks. Um, you know, we've gotten lax in not doing that. And it's not so much as we talk about it that we think that any one of those things is going to help us to um, course correct the spread of the, of the virus. But we think all of them combined are ways to re-engage people in the notion that we're going to have to work really hard to protect each other so that we keep our workforce safe. So things like the temperature check, things like the mask mandate, things like um, reducing the number of people that are in the building at any certain time, uh, really being strict about the social distancing, encouraging department heads to take their workforces and put them on staggering shifts again. If you can work from home, we're going to encourage department heads to have staff working at home. And we're doing this um, all between January 3rd and January 22nd, uh, figuring that that's going to be where, if we are going to see it, we're going to see a spike um, again. And we're at a stage in Livonia where you know, we really can't afford to lose any more of our workforce. And then from a more global, just step back one step uh, perspective, we have no beds left in the hospital. I mean, we're at maximum capacity right now at St. Mary Mercy Hospital. So our secondary message to our workforce is stay healthy and, and not just prevent yourself from getting COVID, but just stay healthy, period. You know, don't take any unnecessary risks. You know, <laughs> really work hard so that you're not in the hospital for something um, unnecessarily. Um, so a lot of uh, safety messaging um, is going to begin uh, between now and the new year and then with some stricter protocols going into place right after the new year. So um, just wanted to share a little bit of the work that we were doing in that area. Okay. Anybody else in the audience? Just one comment too. After my eight or 10 hours a day for the city of North, well, my previous life was in the automotive realm, and I still kind of run a data company for the automotive in Detroit. We have found almost one out of two people were affected with COVID, mentally, how they engage, how they came back. So with um, Canton's situation and all of ours, it happens. We brought in mental health professionals. We paid for anything. We gave surveys. <coughs> how they needed assistance when we engaged back again. 
I think it's up to all of us as elected officials. How do we do that for our people and our municipalities and our towns too? We had to do it to get back to be productive again, but I see that it's just not in the municipality, it's in the business world. And it was a big risk, but we surveyed them and almost half of them, 40, 45% wanted you know, some sort of activity to reach out and to talk to others. It was very tough for half of our employees. We have scientists, they're, they're very intelligent, they're PhDs, they wanted to be around in groups. When they weren't in those groups, they broke down. So I think it is an opportunity. I don't know what the answer is, but it's in every layer of society right now. So that is my other life every once in a while. So just as a note, okay. it's in our world. Anybody else? Good morning again. I'll be very brief. I'm, I'm, I'm constrained in talking about any individual cases so that we do not taint the prosecution. But suffice to say, I think you all know, our juvenile division has been very busy in the last week. Uh, I came forward mainly because Prosecutor Worthy, for the last five years, has been sending out a school threats letter. All of you have received, have received the letter. We have refined it each and every year to point out to the parents, the students, and the school districts and their school boards, the penalties associated with school threats depending upon the level. Three years ago, we only had a 20-year felony that we could implement against this type of activity. In 2019, the law was changed so that now there are misdemeanors as well as the felony. Suffice to say, uh, with your permission, I will go back and send the letter electronically to CWW to, to have it disseminated to all of you. Prosecutor Worthy just wanted to let you know, um, you know, there's no solution for this right now. Uh, however, we're doing everything we can, even with the scarce resources that we have. And I will tell you that Kim Worthy is ahead of the forefront when it comes to not merely punishment of juvenile offenders, but also treatment of ju juvenile offenders and trying to prevent these, these unfortunate activities before they take place. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tony. Anyone else? Seeing none. Um, other business? Can I entertain a, a motion to adjourn? I just want to wish everybody a you know, safe holiday um, and a happy new year. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'll motion give you to adjourn. That motion, by the way. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.